that's the beauty about technology now. Technology, that's like computers and stuff, right? That's, that's cell phones okay. only. <laughs> Brent Sheets. So I you pronounced got it right. It. I you pronounced did. it right. You saw that? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the show. Dun-na, dun-na, dun-na. It's, er- it's early. You know what makes it feel early? The cold. That's it. If yes. Th- at this time, normally, if it wasn't cold, <clears throat> we'd be fine. You're wrapping your work day about this time, usually. Yeah, you've got everything done. <laughs> what? Uh, I was looking at your IMDb. It's uh, full. Really? Yeah. No, it's not. Everything. I don't Everything. know who fills it up. Is it you? Who fills no. this stuff up? I, I always wonder who fills that stuff up. I think if somebody, if our Australian partners who do TV shows with us read the credits and do it automatically, then sure, I'm in it. But I I think I've I logged in once years ago. I should go check what I do. Yeah, a lot. You do know. a lot. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> give For the people that don't know, give us a, just a little quick uh, resume. Brent Shias 101. Um, the Wikipedia. I don't think there's any Wikipedia in me. I don't think there is. There might be. Uh, it would be very short. I um, I work for Just for Laughs. I produce. I'm the director of television content, English side of Just for Laughs. So <clears throat> produce the stand up portions, not the gags. Unless you're my wife's family who live in Switzerland who don't know stand up and love gags, then yes, I do all the gags. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I started in 1991 volunteer with Bruce, um, and started in programming, doing uh, selecting acts and producing shows, and then shifted over to communications, distribution, uh, and then ended up in TV, because I think there's more latitude in terms of opportunities in TV as opposed to programming. Programming's very difficult. Also, programming's highly stressful, because everybody, um, all the acts that you book, might cancel for whatever reason. Really? And there's no... The, 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 the hosts, mainly. That's the key people. And they just got a TV show. I got a movie. What am I... Your oh, comedy yeah, show? Sure, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to host your comedy show. I'm done. So it has happened where people cancel last minute. Uh, we've had John Cleese in 2009 show up. And when he showed up, he was in terrible shape, had to go to the hospital with an infection. And the gala was that night. What or was he doing? Well, how do you, he just wasn't taking care of himself? I don't even know. I don't. We never got the upshot of it. But he was in the hospital overnight, getting uh, IV drips and stuff. And so that night, Lewis Black hosted the John Cleese gala. Lewis Black, you see that coming in uh, off the bench? He's ready to go. Bench. He was he was hosting <laughs> the following night, but he arrived that afternoon. We said, "Hi, Lewis. How are you? Would you like to... So we have a business proposition that, Yeah, for let me tell you. Save so us. So what we did was the um, John Cleese, it was just a 24-hour thing, so he was fine. So we announced John Cleese Gala will be on Sunday night, which was our all-star gala, barnstorming style, so no, no host. Caroline Ray, Louis C.K., I think John Panette was on it as well. And um, we doubled up that night and did both galas hosted by John Cleese. And the, I think it was Wednesday night, was hosted by Lewis Black. Thursday by Lewis Black as well, the first one replacing John. So anyways, all that to say, you can never predict what's going to happen. I mean, we've had people walk out. We got a guy punched in the face on stage at our gal in 1991. Well, you got a guy punched in your face from, a, from an audience member? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you don't know that story? No. A gentleman who shall remain unnamed because he threatened to sue us if it ever airs again. Oh, really? <laughs> but from another nation, not this one, someone okay. overseas who was a shock comic uh. and just very offensive. And he was doing the nasty show. And we said, um, okay, you could do the nasty show, but you've got to give us a, t- a set for TV. So he said, ah, no problem. <laughs> so at that point, we didn't vet material. We didn't oversee material. We just said, okay, he's going to do a TV set. Goes up on stage and opens with hello, moose effers. Hello, <coughs> moose fuckers. That was the, that was the opening good, line. Good opening so said, line. Oh, come on, man in his, the accent of his nation. Um, and then he went on to insult everybody, including the uh, French. Now, the thing is, I'll, for your listeners and comedy fans who might not know, um, our gala audience is, is comprised of 80% Anglophones. This is rough. 70% Anglophones and 30% Francophones who are fluent in English and love seeing the big stars, Steve Martin, Jerry Seinfeld, Tim Allen, whoever's there. Yeah. Love to see because they're fans, which is great. So... This gentleman went on and just razzed on the French. I hate all the French. The 
Yeah, taxi stand. Ooh, hey, le taxi. Oh, shut up. Oh, God. Swearing at them. And then the capper line was, the only thing worse than the French people who live here are the English people who let them stay. Oh, no. <coughs> Excuse me. So he said that line, and a gentleman, we have it on camera, a gentleman in the about 10th row from the middle, uh, Théâtre Saint-Denis de, so he stands up and he goes towards the aisle, and people think, he's going to the bathroom, you know, or he's so offended he's leaving, and he turns towards the stage. And then security goes, eh, nah, what? Walks up on stage, grabs the mic out of this gentleman's hand, and says, oh yeah? Punches him in the face once, rears back, punches him in the face twice, <laughs> and on the second punch, security, security had thought, it's a plant. Oh no, so and they the, were just letting him lick yeah, And the performer's <laughs> forgotten to tell us, which sometimes happens. So we'll just let it go. But by the second punch, they went, you know what? I don't think it's a plant. So bang, bang. Uh, they go off into the wings, and Kevin Nealon was hosting that night. I like um, Kevin Nealon. He's hilarious. Mike falls down. Everything's uh, in disarray. And, you know, security by that time had dragged people off stage. And uh, Kevin Nealon comes up to the mic, picks the mic up off the floor, and says, uh, Performer name, everybody, give it up for performer name. And people go, oh, God, Did that guy just get punched in the face? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yay. And he did uh, about six seconds of, Okay, your next act, and the next act was Brian Hart, who's a respected Canadian comic, yeah. very strong comic, and just. Brian went out and told jokes for about three minutes and then just said, I'm going to stop now and walked off. And we did a little intermission. Because it was just awkward for everybody? It's just impossible. Yeah, how do you... Everybody's listening to Brian Hart going, did, that, did you see that? That guy got punched in the face. Anyways, that was the only time that I know of that a guy got punched in the face on stage. Now, let me ask you, uh, this was a TV taping. Yep. I mean, you had content there for pay-per-view. Absolutely. Yeah. We, it aired um, once as part of our Just for Laughs Worst Of Oh. And that was a great half hour of television, let me tell you. And then what happened? The guy uh, called <coughs> and threatened? Uh, it's a long story, but he gave his rights for a couple of years, and okay, he claimed he never signed it, but he did. But the rights have expired, and oh. it aired a couple of times since then by mistake. There was an anniversary show where Dom Herrera pulled up the clip and did a set about <laughs> various things that had <laughs> happened over the years, and that was one of them, and it snuck in, and... Uh, the person contacted us from his nation of Scotland and said, if it airs again, you will hear from my lawyers. Oh, that's hilarious. But, you know, here's the thing. It did happen. It's not like you're making yeah. it up. It's not CGI. Mm. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's art. But, you know, the thing is, he, he's, <laughs> I'm not saying you should punch. I'm not saying you should punch uh, comedians. You're not condoning it. No, because then just I'm going to start getting punched in the face. <laughs> but <laughs> Not by me, just viewers. But listening. did he want, like, did he know what was going to happen? He just went out and started shitting on people. <clears throat> um... He is a shock comic who insults everybody. I mean, it's it's he was doing the nasty show for a reason because he's so offensive and he works hard at it. Yeah. So um, he was, and people think they're shock comics. They've never seen this guy. I mean, till this day, he's still performing okay. and he's doing well. And he's a he's also a a, a world class. And this is not my opinion, but people who know magic better than I do. Oh, really? Uh, world class uh, close up magician. That's hard. A card but magician, impossible. So he marries the two, but he prefers doing stand up, but uh, magic pays the bills. If he could have used <coughs> some of that magic to disappear when that fist was coming to his face, la, 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 that would have been a nice be fucking wonderful. act. That would have been a great video to have. Oh, man. So I've got a ton of stories. I don't know if you want to cover some of those stories or yeah, my favorite of acts of all time. Yeah, I want to hear that because <coughs> the thing is, you see it from a different lens. And oh. uh, I'm planning on having Bruce on too. See, I want to see from your eyes how you're seeing. Uh, comedy, how you're seeing the festival, right? You're seeing it from the inside yeah. out. Must be a much different way to look at things. Well, when I when I scouted comedy, well, that was a, a really fun part, is going to the Edinburgh Festival each year and scouting comedy and seeing some of the best acts in the world and some of the mediocre acts in the world. And I went, uh, I think, 11 times, starting in 1995. And... <clears throat> There's great comedy out there, and there's a lot of mediocre, like any yeah. rock and roll, theater, whatever. Every scene has it. Exactly. So, um, but I can remember some of the highlights. <clears throat> and scouting people and bringing them here. Um, I discovered Little Britain, the, the act, as you probably know, is Ber Sir Bernard Chumley. They were called Sir Bernard Chumley and Friends. It's a character comic from the UK. And since then, they've done Crodman Dune and the Flaming Sword of Doom. 
They've done Little Britain. Yeah. Uh, they've done a bunch of other shows as well. And David Walliams is one of the judges on Britain's Got Talent. <coughs> He's sort of a posh guy. How'd you, how'd you see them? How'd you... In a 140-seat theater called the Wildman Room, part of Assembly Rooms in Edinburgh. And they'd been doing it a few years, but I saw them doing their show, Sir Bernard Chumley and Friends. And they do, like I said, c- there's three of them doing characters. And um, it's really funny. I mean, it's one of the few shows I saw, I think, three times one year. Just because it, so, it was a guilty pleasure. It was just so funny. And um, they came to the festival and had a not a great experience because we put them in a 140-seat room. Nobody knew who they were. Nobody cared. I told all my friends, go buy a ticket to the show. It's, I think it was $11. I said, if you don't like, if you walk out of there saying, look me in the eye and say, I don't, didn't like that show, I didn't find it funny, I will give you double your money back. I will. I've never had to pay out over the years. I've offered that offer many times on shows that are unknowns. <clears throat> and some of my friends didn't go, but two years later said, you know what, there's this act in, in the UK called Little Britain. You should bring them over. I said, I had them over two years ago. Told you to go see them. And 140 seat theater. You didn't listen. Now, now we can't afford them. They did. They did Live Aid. They did this stuff. Remember that Live? Oh, Aid? I remember they what Live Aid was. Comedy things between a whole. But you could YouTube it. They're on Live Aid. Uh, three years after we had them, mega stars. So that was a uh, little Britain. We've discovered um, there's a comedy duo. Some of my favorite. I don't know if we want to talk about this, but some of my favorite acts over the years. Um, Discovered in Edinburgh or elsewhere. From Edinburgh, there was um, actually from the Melbourne Comedy Festival, saw Leno and Woodley, um, a comedy duo, physical comedy, just absolutely impossible to describe other than two goofy guys, one of them goofier and more physical than the other, <clears throat> one of them sort of the straight man, and one of the funniest comedy duos I've ever seen in my life. And they, they bro- they're not together anymore. They broke up, but one guy still performs on his own. And they they split up basically, but still perform. But that was one of those things when Pat Donnelly, the Gazette theater critic, um, it was a small series that um, just laughs underground. We called it, and uh, she came to see it to review it, and she said, "My," and there were I don't know twenty people in the Centaur Two, the small Centaur Theater. I said, what, "Brent, where did you find these guys? These guys are unbelievable, but I've never heard of them." I said, "Exactly, nobody's ever heard of them in North America." They're stars in Australia, but they want to they want to do more. But it's tough to get an audience when you've got the problem with the festival. As you know, there's so many shows at the same yeah. time, so you got to choose. And a lot of the hidden gems are to be discovered, but they're nobody you've heard of. You haven't heard of these guys. But trust us, we scour the world and we try and find the best stuff. If it's going to be part of the festival, it's worth your money and your time. Hey, ideally, yes, yeah. and. Everybody has their own preference, you know? You've, you like this type of comedy, I like this type of comedy, so you gotta do a little research, and now with YouTube, obviously, and, and Instagram, and you could find out anything about anybody. But back in the day, 95, you'd look at a promo, uh, listen for the ad, try and describe it in two sentences, and compete with everything else, when you've got 2,000 seats to sell at a gala versus 140 seats times two shows, you got to spend more money in marketing the galas. So there's that. There's a Montreal group called um, uh, Clowns Gone Bad, which is uh, Al Goulam, Dina Aziz, were the dramaturgs and director, respectively, um, did a show called Mokshplat, which is the all-clown, all-gibberish version of Macbeth. All-clown, <clears throat> all-gibberish. Unbelievable. Genius. Genius. It was basically born from the Shakespeare in the Park folk, some of them. And they got together some friends and said, because they're so bored of doing Shakespeare in the Park, where it's, you know, in the park. And so in the lead-ups and rehearsals, they developed this gibberish language and said, what if we do this in clown? And it's one of the genius shows that I've ever seen. Because if you're a fan of Shakespeare, it's screamingly funny. If you're not a fan of Shakespeare, it's still really quite funny. I mean, case in point, they did, they had bad, like, not bad, but clever, but cheap props. And one of them was a, a sword, you know, Shakespeare, uh, Hamlet killing each other or whatever. And the sword became the haka haka. <coughs> so a lot of onomatopoeia, where it's bang, crash, you know, haka haka. And they talk about killing each other. And is this a sword dagger I see before me? The 
uh, monologue, the soliloquy, I guess you'd call it. I'm not, I don't know if that's accurate. Well, but, I'm, not, I'm not good with that. But uh, with words. But um, it was very identifiable because you could see the cadence and see this grammar structure, even though it was gibberish. So it's impossible to describe, but we, um, we shopped it around. We tried to get some interest from uh, off-Broadway producers, but they felt it was more a college thing. And What do they mean by that? Um, they didn't think it was an off-Broadway show that would do well or for whatever reason. And this is people that I don't, I don't know. I'm not in that business, but we thought it would be great. I mean, think about it. You got like New York City with a lot of tourists coming in and it's not an English show. It's a whatever show. What do, you, what do you think your ratio is hit and miss when you're, let's say, trying to push something towards uh, Broadway, if you're trying to shop it around there? I, I don't pretend to be a Broadway expert, so I don't <laughs> even know, because we, we had that division as well, where we did Kinky Boots. We were involved in that, won a couple of Tonys for that, and did some development on some other things, but mainly as investors, just Flaps Theatricals, which I think recently is uh, less in existence than it was. Is there a particular reason? Uh, well, the whole Jill Bear thing. Oh, yeah. What, so here's the thing. I didn't even know. I, no. I guess it's because, uh, I don't know, I'm more interested in the English scene, but I didn't even know who he was. Exactly. I was just going to say that. <clears throat> On the French side, Gilbert Roson is the founder of the festival, French and English. Um, he started in French and then brought Andy Nullman on board to help him start the English, which he did. So people on the English side associate Andy Nullman with the English side of the festival and Gilbert with the French side. Now, Gilbert in France is a, is a noted figure in the comedy and theatrical community. He represented Charles Trenet, who's like the Frank Sinatra. Oh, really? Okay. He represented some artists, had, has an office in Paris, and he's the mean judge on France and Incroyable Talent. Oh, it's like uh, it's France has America's talent? Got talent, yeah. But, uh, oh. And he's the mean judge and has been for eight years, nine years, something like that. Turns out he's really mean. Uh, exactly. So he still gets recognized. I have a colleague who was in Paris with him just when the story broke and said, people don't really care about it that much. Um, people still want selfies with him on the street. Oh, wow. They haven't heard a lot about it, but they um, uh, cut the show off the air as soon as the story broke and subsequent episodes, because, you know, they film it way in advance, um, featured everyone except for Gilbert. They cut him out editorially, used oh, different wow. camera angles and cut him out. So, um, But right now, it's it's a difficult time for the company. More so, I feel bad. Fe- uh, I feel for my French colleagues because they're very closely, I mean, Gilbert is a face of the festival in French, so it's difficult for them. More so than us, like you said, a lot of people on the Anglo side don't really know who Gilbert is. But he is the founder of the event, and um, so it's a tough time for the company, more so on the French side than the English side. I mean, we're still delivering our TV shows and still have deadlines to respect, which i got to get back to the office soon to oversee those. But um, it's always been fu- the festival's always been fun, and the reason I got into it was because I went to an outdoor show in 1990 <clears throat> with some friends and free outdoor programming, people running around doing things, and I thought, this is, this is wild. Who organized this? So I looked it up in the Yellow Pages, which kids, Yellow Pages is a thick book we used to have with phone numbers listed on it. He means uh, Google for old people. Google for old people. And yellow paper, very thin <laughs> paper. So I looked it up and phoned it and then got in touch. And Bruce was the one who they passed me up to. And he had me in for an interview and said, listen, we have nothing right now. But if you call back in a month, we might have something. Volunteer maybe. And I, I had a business with my father. We did... Power sweeping underground parking garages. It's very, oh. very glamorous, very glamorous. So you work overnight in dust and dirt. It was basically a little tiny street sweeper that you sit on, like a Zamboni. And you clean those? Uh... It's, you wouldn't imagine, unless you look at it, all the downtown high-rises have underground parking. Yeah. In the winter, all of the cars you see have slush on them. They drive into the parking, they park, the slush after half an hour, two hours, whatever, melts, falls off, melts into the floor, and that slush ain't white, as you've probably noticed. Yep. There's a ton of dirt in it, a literal ton. Um, so Shadow Champlain, we did the IBM building, 1250 René Levesque West. We did a whole bunch of buildings in the Schmata business area, a bunch of hotels. And it's people with medium-sized parking lots don't want to buy their own machine because the machines are expensive. 
don't want to hire someone to do the work, so they hire out a company. It's subcontracting, whatever. So it's, anyways, all that to say, we did that, and that you work when people aren't there. So in business towers, you work starting at yeah. 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. to 6 a.m. Basically, that's when you have to clean because there's no cars there. Which is we good. Did. You don't we have did. to deal with people. Exactly. We did Dorval Airport. We did Mirabel Airport. We did uh, the, those stackable um, parking. <clears throat> so that was fun. But I had all that to say, I had my days relatively free. I'd sleep in because I'd finish work at 6 in the morning. So sleep till noon or 1. And then Bruce said, after about five times coming back and him saying, I've got nothing, um, he said, why don't you, would you be interested in flyering for our shows in 1991? And this is late June, early July, 1991. I said, sure. <coughs> Excuse me. So I started flyering in afternoons. And he said, but I can't pay you. It'll be volunteer work. I said, okay, well, just give me tickets to shows. And he said, okay. So it was a good deal. I thought it was the deal of the century because all I had to do was flyer for him for these shows, one of which was Bill Hicks, who you might know. Oh, yes. Bill Hicks did a one-man show, and that was the show that basically launched him into the UK and into notoriety. The UK came in, uh, Channel 4, our partners, came in and filmed that show, and that was uh, Relentless, which you probably, you can YouTube it. It's all over the place. It's Pantel, you can back me up. Is that popular among stand-ups? Yes. I mean, it's, it's in yes, yes, many, it's many stand-ups' top ten lists. Exactly. Yeah. Many. And these are well-versed stand-ups, not neophytes or people who don't know stand-up. These are people who've researched it. Not open it. micers. Not open micers. They might know about it. But I think people who are, you know, if you talk to probably people, um, uh, Louis Black, uh, John Stewart, I think people like that, John Oliver, would all probably have Bill Hicks in their top 10. Uh, cutting, political, yeah. socio-political, uh, unafraid of anything. Anyways, he did that show that year. So I was flying for that, and I thought it was a great um, opportunity because I got to do this, and I got to see shows for free. And Bruce thought it was the deal of the century because he got this guy flying, and all he has to do is give him sh tickets to shows, which cost him nothing, basically. It's not sold out. Just give him tickets. This was a great marriage. Oh, it was wonderful. So... Um, Two weeks after the festival, he said, can you come back and we'll pay you to do the uh, press clippings. And that festival was the year that, that uh, the performer from Scotland got punched in the face. I agree. So the clipping <laughs> books were massive all over the U.S., North America, the world. The clippings <laughs> were rolling in and all versions of the a play on the words punch line you could possibly imagine. But, but it was a story. You know, yeah. a performer gets punched in the face on stage for telling jokes. <clears throat> so it was a big story. So that was my start, and then I started working for Bruce full-time in 94, 1994, and then just grown to different departments and doing different things. And you, it's, it's interesting, because you, you came in as, a, as just a fan, a lover of comedy, yeah. but you, were, you never did stand-up, you never had the bug to go on stage. No. Interesting. No, not really. I've, you know, perfor performed or emceed a wedding or something like that, but I just... And my wife bugs me. She says, you know, but for the end of this year, she said a few years ago, I want you to try a stand-up routine. I said, it's not really, <laughs> it's not that easy. Making you laugh, my darling, is different than making the great unwashed laugh. The great but unwashed. <laughs> it's still a bug in the back of my mind, but it's also highly unfair, having been in the business and scouting comedy for so long. Oh, yeah. I, I would know a lot of bits that I would, I would be tempted to borrow, but my own um, moral... An ethical duty would be not to borrow, yeah. so it's just very, very difficult. <clears throat> but it is tempting at the end. But I, I fully realize and completely understand how difficult an art form it is. It's not. It's been, it's been categorized as the most difficult art form because it's not you singing cover song. It's not you with a band. It's not you reciting line. Well, lines, but the lines are your own. I think it was Jeremy Hot said. There's immediate gratification and immediate editorializing by the audience. Yep. Because it's very difficult. Uh, John Cleese said it best. Ah, oh, the most sa saddest sound in the world, forced laughter. Oh. And ha 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 ha. So it's it's very difficult to fake and not you could never get an entire audience to fake it. I mean, what's the point? Yeah. Why bother? So it's that immediate thing where if you're a success, you'll know about it right away. So it's, and it's probably like a, something very addictive, I would imagine. I've heard from many acts that it's very, it's tough to go away. And once you got yeah. that first laugh, you want a bigger laugh and a standing ovation and 
Tommy Tiernan in 2006, I think it was, he was doing his one-man show, and he was getting standing ovations after every show. And he was doing eight shows, and this was show five. And I just went over. I said, hey, Tommy, how are shows going? Oh, standing ovation every time. I said, that's great. How do you think, like, what would make you go, wow, now that you have five, you know, standing ovations at Just for Laughs? He said, well, he thought about it for a bit, and then only Tommy Tiernan could do this. He said, you know what? If the audience at the end, I finished my last joke, and they just sat there and just stunned silence. Like, they can't believe the show was that good, and they just sat there, couldn't move, and, and slowly calcified. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's it. That's okay. it. That'll there top go. it. Walk out. End I would have said career. six. It's like, you got five. Say, what's next? <laughs> six. <laughs> People carrying me out on their shoulders. So, um, yeah, and now, now doing stand-up, I get to see the other side of the, the event where I can't go see every show. But the, the beauty of the festival, and you probably know this, is those surprise shows, the midnight shows, yeah. the, the unannounced lineup shows, because this past summer, here's what happened. Kevin Hart's in town. Doing a and, and Jim Carrey's in town as well. Jim Carrey went to the Comedy Nest to watch a show, yeah. unannounced, and and he just sat there and watched the show. And now he's not performing stand up much or at all anymore, from what I understand. So he didn't want to go on stage; just wanted to enjoy a show. But for people in the audience and the uh, performers on stage, can you imagine? So we're taping a series called LOL at JFL um, for Kevin Hart's new launched program on Lionsgate with Lionsgate. So it's LOL platform. He's doing game shows, reality shows, sitcoms, everything, including stand-up. And he, he wants to come here. And you can, you can research this, but Kevin Hart credits us with starting his career. He cred- he's gone on record with Bill Brown, City of the Gazette, saying, no, 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 I've never hidden that fact. I got my start here. I think it was New Faces in 2005 or something. He did a gal in 2006 and nine. Um, but he says, yeah, 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 that's where I got my start. So, and developed his career. And he's been on... Um, <clears throat> many things since then, obviously, big movie star now, but he wanted to do a, a stand-up platform with just the best stand-ups in the world. And he knew Montreal's the place where we get the best of the Irish, best of the Scottish, best of New Zealand, best of Australia, best of the UK, best of Canada, best of U- uh, USA. On any given year, there's people rotating through. So he said, let's film. And uh, 2016, we did uh, 52 15-minute shows. 52. It was uh, six nights of comedy, two shows a night, and barnstorming. So there's no host. We had one warm-up act doing six minutes, and then he stayed in the wings and introed every act. So as I called it, the great conveyor belt of comedy. So if somebody bombed, the um, MC would walk out on stage, do 90 seconds, basically set the table again, and keep going. And if somebody got a standing ovation, he'd go out, do about 45 seconds to make it fair yeah. for the next act. Um, because we had everything from Homegrown to us. Todd Barry did this series. I mean, we had some Australian, basically the Australian version of Letterman came and did the oh, series wow. just because it was kind of fun. Why not? Sure. Yeah. Six minutes set. Uh, eight minutes set. Let's go. <clears throat> so, so anyways, all that to say, last year we did 52, this year 39 episodes. And um, Kevin Hart's in town both years to watch the shows. To watch. So this year, he's in town, and on the second night he's in town, he called our programming and said, listen, I want to do a set. I said, what? (laughs) Okay. Um, How about, and they put him on Midnight Surprise. This is the Midnight Surprise show on a Thursday night, I believe it was. And that's at Monia Manasena downstairs. So the Hydro-Quebec room, I think it's 200 seats, maybe. It's the one. It's a beautiful room with a balcony, but the thing about Midnight Surprise, we announce who the host is. And that's it. That's why it's a surprise. So there are a whole bunch of acts, some homegrown acts. And um, and then the last act on, Donnell Rawlings was hosting. And he's friends with Kevin. So he says, ladies and gentlemen, this next act. And this was two minutes to one in the morning. And he says, ladies and gentlemen, this next act. He's, uh, I actually never heard of him before. He's done some TV and movies, I think. <laughs> Anyways, here's Kevin Hart. People <laughs> lose their <laughs> minds. And so Kevin walks on stage. And he'd just done, to, to set, uh, the, the, um, set the table for this, he'd done the Bell Center oh, yeah, 16 yeah, months true. prior and sold it out. So done very well for himself. And yeah. tickets were more than the Midnight Surprise. Anyways, oh, yeah. so people go, what? So he walks on stage, gets a standing ovation, of course. And the thing to do for a, a guy of that caliber, you could just sleepwalk through, do audience work, whatever, because you're Kevin Hart. Who yeah. cares? People are so thrilled to see you. 
He did 48 minutes of material. This guy. For his new special. And most of it was killer. And it was fantastic. People just, he ended up at, I think it was two minutes to two in the morning when he walked off stage. So, okay, that's it for me. Hope you enjoy the show. People just walked out of there going, did that really happen? They just got their money's <laughs> worth. Oh. And that's the thing about the festival. You don't know what's going to happen. Who's going to show up on this? Jimmy Carr does little sets here and there. Russell Peters, when he's in town, loves the comedy nest, comes up there, does whatever. But they're never going to announce it in advance because then people wouldn't go to the solo shows yeah. or whatever other shows they're doing, which makes sense. And the act sometimes cancels at the last moment because they're out for dinner with their manager and they're really discussing something important. So they just, yeah, I can't go. Okay. What are you going to do? Yeah. So that's why we don't announce the lineups because it, it's constantly shifting. But if you're looking for bang for your buck and you're in town for the festival, go to the regular shows. You want to see a gala? Great. You want to see a one-man show by somebody famous? Go for it. To cap your night off, go to one of the late night shows. You're going to see seven acts, eight acts, four of them you'll hate, uh, three of them you'll love, and one will be what? Yeah. And what in a good way or what in a horrible way? But that's, that's the joy of it. You're going to see a guy from New Zealand you've never heard before mixed in with somebody from Australia, mixed in with a South African dude you've never heard of before. But wow, this guy was really sociopolitical, and I didn't even know ab that about apartheid or whatever yeah. because it's a different perspective and that's the joy of the festival I think anyways I'm babbling on and on oh but this is good these, these are great uh, <clears throat> these are great stories I like the Kevin Hart one I like the the showing up last minute mm. it happened with Chappelle last time where it was Theater yeah. St. Catherine everybody freaked out yep it was last minute everybody was tweeting it I remember Louis uh, C.K.'s done it on the Nasty Show a few times uh, Joe Rogan's done it a few times so yeah you never know do you ever get people because everybody knows Just for Laughs yeah. um, if I have a. I always go back to one um, situation where I'm like, okay, everybody, whether they're comedians or not, that's what they know Montreal for. Um, a little while back, I was at. Uh, I was in California. I was at uh, Pasadena, uh, the Ice House. Yes. Uh, it was Thursday, or Friday night. Uh, hosting was Fraser Smith. Yep. So I get off stage, uh, and as soon as I get off, he, he brings on the next. He talks about the next act. We start. Uh, I start shooting the shit with him. Right? Did you? What did you think of the set? This and that. Because I, I like Fraser Smith. I wanted to get his opinion. We're talking. So the second I mentioned Montreal, he's like, uh, yeah, just for laughs. Like, that's the only thing. Yeah. He's like, so, you know, you're doing that over there. Like, the first thing that went to his head when he heard uh, that I'm from Montreal was just for laughs. That was the only topic of conversation he <laughs> wanted to bring up because that's what he knew, right? But this is, the reason I bring this up is because as a comic, he thought just for laughs. But then at the airport, I got into a conversation over um, over a bagel. It's a small conversation with somebody. Oh, where are you from? This and that, Montreal. And like, oh, comedy festival. Just for laughs. Yeah. Not a comedian, but his head right away went. He heard Montreal Comedy Festival, just yeah. for laughs. So one night, it was the comedian who, it makes sense. On the other night, just some guy at the airport. Some guy at the airport who automatically his head went to just for laughs. That's what we're known for now. In in comedy, uh, frequent, often we're finding we're known um, in certain circles as the Montreal Comedy Festival, not just for laughs. And people know more just for laughs is gags. Yes, that's which what I is, think it is. Which is fine. We'll take it. Because Gags ain't a bad property as well. It's sort of a, a sister company. It started out under our division, and then it calved off in, into its own company. But it's still got the name, which is lovely and fantastic. Helps us in, in various nations around the world. People love They <coughs> show them in Greece. The Gags are popular yeah. on Greek TV. Oh, we found out we're on uh, cab headrests in Singapore. That is insane. Uh, pirated. Well, you know what? Because so, it's so funny, and you don't need language. Yeah. So we've gotten... When I worked in distribution for a bit, we get uh, sampler gags, like guys trying to submit their ideas for gags from various African nations. And some of them are, really? You're sending us this? Really? Are and any of them good, like, though? Uh, there was one that was kind of good. It was, a, I believe it was Nigeria, a guy, um, two people <laughs> with boxing gloves. <laughs> And they're in an yeah, open said, park. I believe it's Nigeria. No, like, it was a guy who was asking yeah. us to to send him our uh, our credit card information. Yes, I I am. We lottery, were inheriting actually. money. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Apparently, Brent Shiasinski yeah. is in a plane crash somewhere, and they traced it back to me. Yeah. So, um, I've got to meet him at the airport later with bags of cash to pay for some taxes. But that's it. And then yeah, and then I'm going to get the cash. Um, so the the uh, the premise was, and the, it was you know what for. For some guys in some nation like that, they're non-professionals. It wasn't badly filmed. It wasn't great, but it wasn't badly filmed. Um, two guys with boxing gloves pretend they're sparring, and they're near. They're in a park, but near a path, 
and basically they spar and they end up sparring and getting someone walking on the path uh, between them. You know, so they're sparring around somebody. Right, right, right. But that, that person's a plant. No, 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 no. They did it. Oh, they're just going to punch some <laughs> random guy? Not punch, but punch around. Like, this is the okay. ref stuck between two boxers. Oh, right, around right, right. Hey, get out of my way. What, what are you doing? So it's kind of funny, but we can't use that premise because we have our own writers, our own, you know, mm-hmm. so you can't just jump somebody in and use their right. Then you get a lawsuit. It's, it's just not worth it. Yeah. But, um... No, I mean, it's a, it's a popular premise. I don't even know how we got into gags. I don't know how we got... Uh, oh, yeah, we were talking just about how everybody knows Montreal as yeah. uh, Just for Laughs. And but I, the, the, the fun part is some of these South African acts, we had a big South African contingent because we announced at the festival we're doing a Just for Laughs Africa in Durban, South Africa, starting next year. Um, and one of the acts was an um, up-and-coming act, and he said another an, uh, one of the stand-up acts, I think there were nine of them, in town for the festival as part of the launch. <clears throat> and they performed, actually most of them performed on the LOL, the Kevin Hart oh, there project. Go. And um, so we had a conversation with uh, Robbie, Robbie, I forget his last name, but Robbie is a good up and coming act. He opened for Trevor Noah for years. And he said, Jason Goliath is another guy who owns a club in, uh, I believe it's Johannesburg. And he said, this guy told me all about the event because uh, he was here three years ago. And he came back, and he was doing the club, and he said, you won't believe the event in Montreal. It's great. You have to go. You have to go. You, Okay, okay. It's a big comedy event. Shut up. And so finally, they come, these two guys, they come, and they said, I'm really upset at him. Why? Because he overhyped it. He said, he didn't even come close to hyping it enough. This is unbelievable. This event, like, we get it. It's a comedy convention, but you've got Kevin Hart here. You've got Jim Carrey here. You've got... Symposiums. You've got a lot of people don't know Comedy Pro. There's, there's, uh, there's table reads of unbelievable sitcoms. Here. There's table reads of, of uh, panel discussions of what's the next thing in comedy. And if you're a comedy geek or anything to do with comedy, you have to go. I I'm bummed out because we're in rehearsals all day. I get to see precious few of these things. But the comedy awards show. You got Jim Carrey up on stage. You got. Um, Kevin Hart presented the award last year. Sorry, Dave Chappelle presented the award to Kevin Hart last year. And the speeches themselves are amazing. I heard um, Jim Carrey's was amazing this year. I didn't even see it. But Do they tape this stuff <clears throat> so we could have it in the archives? There's no rights. No. Huh? No rights. But can they at least tape it just for yeah, just history, for archives. Hi- historical exactly. purposes? Yeah, exactly. But it's some of the stuff that goes on. And then there's shows at night. So the acts that come in and do comedy pro, you know, Paul Feig directors, uh, you name it from sitcoms, come in and talk about the craft, talk about getting into, talk about directing The Office for years, talk about their next project, talk about a new movie, you know, all these things that go on. And then there's, you know, uh, who was it? It was uh, not The Green Room. The Green Room with Paul Provenzo was one really cool show. Oh, yeah, he's, uh, he was on the show. He was, I had him on the podcast. Oh, here. there you go. Uh, this For years, I've been, before even talking to meeting him, a fan of Provenza. Oh, great. This fucking guy. Um, minus the profanity. Um, but uh, he did a show called um, Set List, yep. as you probably know. Oh, yeah. So for your listeners, Set List is where established, and I'm talking as Jimmy Carr did it, Russell Peters did it, uh, you know, very established stand-ups go up on stage and there's a, there's a screen set up behind them and in front of them, facing them so they could see it. And Paul MCs the show and the act walks up on stage with the express knowledge that they will walk on, on stage and will be given uh, a topic to talk about. They do not know the topics in advance. It's not, a, you know, it's not arranged in advance. No, it's no, no, secret. it's not. That's the joy. Paul doesn't know what the topics are. It's his producer who has a laptop <laughs> with, I think it's about a thousand different things and random. And it could be, uh, you know, Saturn's rings. It could be, you know, anything, whatever, anything, Trump's yeah. hair. Milk. But usually it's not something topical. It's something bizarre, like two words that are barely associated with each other. But here you go. Go. And the sta- here's why the stand-ups do it, because it's terrifying for them. Because they're used to uh, stand-up, they're stand-up routines, and it's called a routine for a reason, because it's set material. You know what you're doing, you, you go to your best joke and your second yeah. best joke, and sometimes there's audience interaction, a little bit of improv, but it's, it's quite structured. This is the opposite of structured. 
So acts go up there, and flashing up behind them is their set, not the set list, but one topic. And they have whatever, however long they want to go with that one topic, they go. And sometimes they'll resort to a written joke to start them off. But the acts in the back of the room will call them out on it after. <laughs> so it's very embarrassing. If you go to a set routine, acts in the back are going to shake their heads and go, dude, come on, really? This is set list. You can't do that. So they don't. And acts do it because it's terrifying. Jimmy, Jimmy Carr walked in. Jimmy Carr's a British comic. He's quite famous. Walked in and he saw me. He said, Brent, why am I doing this? Why am I? Do I don't need to do this. Why am I doing this? This is crazy. It's fun, though. Because it's fun. Because you don't know what's going to happen. Anyways, so that's one of the shows that happens during the festival where we don't announce the lineup because who cares what the lineup is? It's a concept. It's very easy to explain to a comedy fan. It's performers going up to an unprepared set list. They don't know what they're doing. Go. Have you guys thought about, um, because now I know most everybody, kind of how you mentioned Kevin Hart has that channel, and uh, even professional wrestling has their own uh, streaming network. Disney's going to do their own thing, you know, split from Netflix, have their own streaming network. You guys ever thought of having uh, some kind of network, whether it's online or produce shows that uh, have some kind of narrative that run the year? For example, it's because you brought up Paul Provenza. Um, the one thing that I think would be a great weekly show if it, would be the green room. If he would, ha- yeah. you have Paul Provence's green room, and you'd have him uh, every week, uh, if not at a different place, even if it's in LA, because there's a good hub of comics there that he could rotate, and have them on talk about the industry, uh, talk about you know current events, what's happening. It'd be amazing. We talked about it with Paul for a while, because um, he filmed some at the festival over mm-hmm. the over a few years stretch actually. But it was a question of ownership, who's going to own the show, who's artistic directing it, who's, you know. So it's a little more complicated. Like when we develop shows, if you're working with a stand-up, who owns the show? Because the festival, there's resources and time that goes into it. So in developing, does the act own 80%? We own 20%? Do they have 50-50? What's, what's our role in it? Are yeah. we going to help them develop it? Or are we just going to be producers of it or just service providers? Do you guys have a hard cutoff where you're like... There's, it's we want to be uh, heavily involved in the creative or we don't want to be involved in the creative or it varies depending on the idea in the it, show. It varies because we have deals for scripted things with various showrunners based in L.A. So we're developing things, scripted, non-scripted. You know, there's a, a, a big process involved. So there's no hard and fast rule. We need 60% or more. <coughs> right, right. It, it just depends. depends. It depends. depends on Which makes sense. Yeah. Keep it variable depending on what the kind of situation arises. Exactly. And there's a lot of Canadian talent. The, the unfair advantage of Canadian talent is, and we've said this for years, we discovered it years ago, is that Canadian talent can be discovered by L.A. agents, managers, producers, TV bookers, um, when they have 10 years under their belt. <laughs> Whereas if you live in L.A., you're going to be seen in the first six months, maybe even three months of your stand-up foray because there's people in the clubs all the time. So if you're in Canada touring around Canada, um, you could get 10 years and then say, you know what, I'm going to take a crack at New York. And you go to New York or L.A. or Chicago, whatever, and you show your craft, and they've never seen you. But this guy's polished. This yeah, guy's yeah. really good. He's out of nowhere. <laughs> How can a guy new at it be this good? Well, I'm not new at it. I've got a Canadian accent. but Big in I'm Japan. An, hey, exactly. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's it's an unfair advantage because you've got you know professional stand-up uh, experience, but you've never been exposed on TV or anything like that. Or, or maybe you have, but within Canada. So you, it's the unfair advantage of going to the States and being being seen uh, for the first time, but not really. So it's kind of fun. I mean, there's a lot of really strong talent in Canada that, that you know of, that I know of, that I'm big fans of, and it's just a matter of time. I mean, yeah. you think about people like uh, y- yourself, Ivan Decker, Graham Chittenden, Pat Thornton. Pat Thornton is one of those guys who had a set at Club Soda three years ago, which is just a monster, monster set. He's a very unique, I hate saying very unique, he's a unique character. Pat Thornton, you know Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, There's a K. Trevor Wilson. Oh, K. Trev. I mean, there's so many guys (laughs) that, and there's, I struggle to think of another act like K. Trevor. And that's not bad. That's great. But, you know, soon I think we're going to have guys emulating K. Trevor. Yeah, because I mean, K. Trevor is one of those guys that everybody, um, like when he comes down the nest and stuff, it's not like a niche thing. Like, oh, that's my... Mm-hmm. St- anybody could go watch K. Trevor Wilson. Mm-hmm. You'll enjoy him. 
He'll surprise <clears throat> you. He's funny. It's smart. Like it's rednecks, alt fans, everything. He, he he hits. He ticks a whole bunch of boxes. So there's, and I'm sure there's people I'm forgetting, but there's a whole bunch of um, Graham Clark. Uh, you know, west to east. There's uh, Leland Clausen makes me laugh a lot. Very physical. Um, he, there's so many acts across Canada that are just not. You know, Russell Peters is great, but not that even the next generation. Yeah. But not the newest generation, sort of the middle, just rising up because they're just good, you know, and they've they've had 10 years at it. And it takes a while, but you just get better and better and better. And there's there's uh, um, opportunities aplenty and that unfair advantage. You've been at it 10 years and you're really good at it. And now, OK, time to think about going to pilot season. Yeah, I, no. I noticed that um, I noticed that in L.A., uh, I made comedy uh, when I first went down there. I made friends in comedy, um, basically because we talked about the differences of the two. Right? They're like, yeah. "Oh, how did you?" <clears throat> and also, they were surprised because there was also an assumption of Canada, and they're like, "Ah, we had never heard of this guy. He has one name, Pantelis." Who, you know? So they were surprised when I got off stage. They're like, "What? Well, I'd never heard of you. Where, exactly. where the fuck did that come where from? Where have you been?" I was like, "Well, I've been doing this for years." You Minus just, the profanity. I'm, I'm in an igloo. <laughs> exactly. Just haven't heard of me, you know. When we're hunting polar bears, somebody had said that I don't know if it was Provenza that brought it up, but somebody had uh, said that Canadian comic were kind of like samurais because we stay up, we have time to kind of hone hmm. like our nin- skills, ninjas. Yeah. And then so then we come down. People are a little bit surprised, but it's because yeah. and also here, like let's say in Montreal, for example, the mic you don't get as many mics as you do in LA. In LA, you can yeah. do six a night. Yeah. That doesn't happen here. No. And when you do want to get quality stage time here, you have to be ready. They ha- you have to have worked on your sh- you can't go to the nest on a weekend. Yeah. And bomb. Mm. You're not going to you're not going to be there for another weekend. Well, exactly. <laughs> you got to be ready. So you have to y- there's no on a Saturday night you're not going to be able to go on stage somewhere where you're not good. You yeah. have to polish your stuff. So it forces you to be better. You can't just do six rooms with three people in it and you know, they'll laugh through your friends. Two drink minimum everywhere, and yeah. so you're forced here to do good, or you're not getting the stage time. That's <laughs> do well, fair. yeah, to do well. I'm sorry. Oh, it's I'm okay. Sorry. <laughs> the, it's but this is why you, produ- police. you get to watch that. <laughs> like this, this isn't making it on TV. You're welcome, grammar police. <laughs> um, what else can we talk about? What um, else would you like where to do you, know? Where do you think it's heading? Because I think it's crazy that it's expanded so much. So there's Vancouver, there's Toronto, Montreal, the, uh, Australia. You guys are just for laughs is headed, or comedy yeah. is headed. Just for laughs, comedy. Is headed to the moon. Comedy. Well, the weird thing is, this past year we had Lily Singh as a gala host. Now she doesn't claim to be a comic. She's a blogger. Uh, I don't know what you'd call her—a YouTube sensation, YouTube an uh, influencer, influencer. That's it. Uh, which is very weird. Um, yes. <laughs> and uh, we look at each other. Some of the producers look at each other. We go, "This is not comedy for us. Like we we are too old for this." And happily, happily, I'm thrilled to learn about a new thing that I go, "Okay." People are cheering for that line. I don't get it, but that's fine. And there's certain acts like that where you just go, okay, it's not stand-up comedy, and that's fine. It's for a different crowd. So that's great. Yeah. We get them involved in the galas and get them educated about stand-up. There we go. You know, but... Um, so Lily Singh is one of them, and uh, you get... There was a YouTube panel. We had YouTube influencers up the past two years. So it's very interesting, but... I, I, people keep saying shorter form, but you look at you know Vine and Snapchat and all these things where it's quick, fast to the point. Where I mean, I've seen stuff online where you just go, it's you know, got forty million views, and yeah. I look at it, and I said, but it's not funny. It's there we weird. Go. It's weird, but it's not funny. But that to to apparently forty million plus people is hilarious, and they want to, okay, okay. Well, then I have to learn about that because. You know, if it is in the comedy realm, we should at least know about it and have an opinion on it. It's an age so. thing. It's an age thing. I've, yeah. Because there's a there's a whole group of people that are growing up with uh, with iPads in their hands, with uh, the internet, right? Yep. Uh, I didn't grow up with the internet. I had to get into the internet. The right? iPad is that computer so, thing, right? That computer thing. Okay. Yeah, those those nerds and those <laughs> scientists are using. <laughs> And I, uh, when you said influence, I laugh because I talked about. It. I had a guest on last episode, and we were talking about how because uh, he has millions of hits on YouTube, is musician, and uh, we were talking about Lily Singh because uh, we used her as an example. She has books now. I saw her translating gr- in Greek, right? So books, a book. She has one book that's right. translated even in Greek because I saw it wow. in in an airport in Athens. And um, the first time I ever heard the term influencer was 2014, 
and it was uh, at uh, the Hollywood Film Awards. And I thought I was special for being there, and I saw these 15-year-old kids hanging out. And I asked the guys at Dick Clark Productions, I go, hey, can I ask a question? I don't know. Like, are they actors? Like, they're 15 They're taking selling. Who are these people? Yeah. And they go, oh, those are YouTube influencers. I was like, they work at YouTube? Like, no, 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 they're, they're just, they put up videos, they cover songs, they yeah. do goofy gags, and they're on YouTube, and they're influencers, so we invite all these influencers to come here. They're on purpose, not professionals. That's it's, what we discovered. They're on purpose, like they're not, it's not going to be the best edited thing, it's not going to be the best produced, best lit, best sound. There we go, yeah. It's just a goofy But they were just thing. kids that were doing yeah. cover songs or whatever. I was like, really? I felt so special, and <laughs> you just took it away from me. <laughs> These random <laughs> kids are here. You kids. I would have succeeded as well if it wasn't for you meddling kids. But it was so crazy to see that because they're influencers and because that'll draw different uh, eyes yeah. on the award show, kids that age group that don't give a shit about the Hollywood Film Awards and exactly. things like that, uh, things of that nature, and that's why they had them there. And they're invited to all these award shows. There's always yeah. uh, influencers. I don't, I fear not in saying I don't get it, but that's fine. Um, yeah, it's, when I first started, go, going back to what we started on earlier, when I first started the festival, I wanted to do something fun and travel. And it's been that, and I told, uh, you know, people around, when when will be enough? I said, when it becomes not fun, or I come into the office and I go, ugh. Ugh. It doesn't feel that way. No. Every day I come in, you can ask any colleague. Ask Bruce. Bruce, I don't do it too much because I don't see him a lot during the week because we work on different floors. But any colleagues, post-production, colleagues in TV, distribution, whatever, I said, in the morning, how are you? I said, it's a great day for comedy. It's a great day for comedy. I say that all day long to everybody. It is always a great day for oh, comedy. That is true, Oh, my goodness. Though. You're working... We used to have, a, like, our accounting department when I worked in different departments. Um, I was never in accounting, but, you know, they complain about, oh, this, this is terrible, this is terrible. I said, hey, 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 hey. You work for the largest comedy event in the world. Sure, the hours suck, and there's bad things about any job. Listen, I can tell you some nuts and bolts about my job that are not that much fun. I'm sure for your this podcasting, there's certain elements, technical, whatever, that are not as much fun it's as the actual the doing. Yeah. Welcome to the world. There's yeah. problems. There's renovate your house. You want to be a ditch digger or power sweep underground parking garages. There's fun parts and boring parts. But you do work for the biggest comedy event in the world. And we had certain people in certain departments who never went to see shows in the summer. I said, you're telling me that you go, you know, Francophone, Anglophone, there's shows for everybody. And there's, you don't like stand-up comedy. There's theater, there's dance shows, there's everything. You're telling me you work, you know, year-round at this event for two weeks in July, just doesn't interest you at all? That's crazy. And so I said, you might as well work at a cardboard box company, with all due respect to cardboard box companies, because you probably get paid more, and why not? Because it's the same thing. I mean, it's accounting, with all due respect to accounting. You know, it's not show accounting, it's just accounting. And I said, well, okay, fine. I'm just trying to understand your methodology and your approach if you're not going to go to see any shows and not be thrilled about it. I'm thrilled about it. It's very fun. I think the, um, the untapped potential, complete tangent, but the untapped potential is clean comedy. I think there's only so far you can go, we've had the nasty show for years. We've never done, I mean, some of our galas are CBC clean, but a comedy show that doesn't deal with uh, drug use, sex, uh, making fun of other faiths or faith in general, just... Pop culture. Think of Brian. Think of think of the top ten sitcoms of all time. Seinfeld. Seinfeld. Ray Romano, King of King of Queens. Not all, of all time, but um, Cheers. But Seinfeld. then you have Curb Your Enthusiasm, Curb which your is enthusiasm. yeah. <laughs> but I mean the 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 nexus, the the starting point for the sitcoms. Yeah. Seinfeld stand up. Ray Romano stand up. Tim Allen stand up. Kevin James is stand up. Whether you like his style or not, I like Kevin all James. All these people. Uh, Mr. Bean, Mr. Bean, find me someone in the world, uh, any language who doesn't know who Mr. Bean is. That's one of the one of our calling cards when you do yeah. international distribution. They always, do you have anything like Mr. Bean nonverbal? And we go to gags. <clears throat> so it's you couldn't say, I mean, Mr. Bean. How's that offensive? No. But it's that type of thing where it's we get some people turned off from stand-up comedy. They think it's all dirty. I well, said no, just uh, you know, come out to this type of show. So. Brian Regan is one of those people, as you probably know, Brian Regan is amazing as a stand-up comic. Never been a movie star, never been a TV star. He's 
been in some sitcoms and bit roles here and there, but never been a major, major, major player. But very successful. I think it's a new Netflix special now. Oh, quite possibly. Right. Um, but it's one of those guys where I watch his specials and I go, this guy's a genius. Even though he's not solving political mysteries, he's not, you know, he's talking about valet parking at hospitals. He's talking about in getting injured. He's talking about his wife and kids and just all these things where it's really funny. Jim Brewer. Uh, Bob Marley is one of my favorite acts, too, the guy from Boston. I mean, there's so many acts that are good and clean. And I think that's a, that's a missing part in the stand-up world where... And, you know, some jaded stand-ups make fun of it. Yeah, you were clean. Yeah. Well, you know no, what? Go, go do a corporate and swear a lot. See where, yeah. <laughs> see what your paycheck's going to be. Yeah, no, you can't at all. Oh, I see. I, the, um, I had some friends doing the investors group tour. Okay. And it's basically, you know, investors group, they do a tour across Canada. I don't know, it's 12 cities or something, where they get the local reps bring their top clients as a reward. And these are some of the you know, really good comics. They bring in an American, a Brit, uh, two Canadians, whatever it is across Canada. And they say, it has to be clean. And so a friend of mine who's a stand-up from Western Canada went on, and he was on the show with three other acts. And one of the other acts dropped an F-bomb or two, but was very funny <clears throat> by mistake. So the, the investors group, the guy who booked them, and the pay is quite good. Yeah, yeah, you oh, know, yeah. Compared to doing clubs and stuff, yeah. it's quite good. And the guy came backstage and said, you're all great. You, sir, were very funny. However, you use some profanity so I'll tell you what's going to happen okay um, you're on the next show but if this happens one more time you're off you will not be paid and you're banned oh wow and we will find someone else because there's people lining up to do this tour yeah of course so we understand if you can't get around it that's no problem but we will find somebody else is that understood because I'm just telling you the, the ground rules I have all these people we're paying you X thousands of dollars to do this and if you can't play by the rules we completely understand but we will find somebody else so the, the gig was, and you agreed to this to work clean. You're not doing that. So you have to. So let us know what you want to do. It's amazing. You know, and it's not, not even the guy wasn't being a, an idiot about it. He was just saying, these are the rules. I'm paying you. You know, I want you to build a house. Well, I, I mean, want yeah, it in no, brick, not, not styrofoam. Yeah, that's what you, you agreed to. You agreed to do it in brick. You yeah. can't do it. Well, I think styrofoam's better. I no. don't care what you think. It's not what I'm, paying, I'm not paying you for. Yeah. So I thought that was very interesting, that perspective of, oh, these guys want me to work clean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's. do you want us to shave off, you know, 80% of your check because you want to work dirty and yeah. work for 20% of the money? No, 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 no. Okay. Well, that's the rules. So it's like, why don't we have that? Anyways, the only that's, question that's I always have <clears throat> in those situations, I always ask, is it uh, is it a language thing or is it a topics thing? And it's always a la- it's the it's normally it's just a don't swear. Yeah, because I don't have um, as a comedian, I don't do uh, just by choice. I just don't like I don't do a gruesome. Like I don't talk about you know uh, shitting. If I, like I don't, it's, yeah. it's not me. It's not what I do. Me, it's mostly politics and anecdotal stories of myself. So all I have to do in those situations is just remove the fucks the this and that yeah and the joke's still there exactly right so that's the lucky part but i have friends i do comedy with where it's that's like in their punchline 20 minutes of what i do yeah. <laughs> they're like i have a four-minute abortion joke i can't do this you know yeah. so it depends it's, on the style of humor because if it's if you're just peppering in words you could take those off and normally you could shift the cadence of the joke and it'll still work really well learned but a lot it, from the tv editing portion because the cw is squeaky clean oh yeah so they don't play games have, no no and uh, the joke is about farting Great. So we'll cut that. Yeah. I said, really? Because he doesn't actually say the word farting. Or matter. But he makes one, you know, and that's it's, it's not what we want. Okay. They're the client. What do you want to do? Yeah, that, you can't, that's why you can't argue yeah. that. Uh, done arguing. But I, I want to understand, so I'll ask a question about it. But, uh, you know, we did a clip show for the CW, and, and they can't have this, can't have that, can't have that. Okay. It's more challenging. It's more fun for me because I go, okay, now I understand the parameters. No problem. We'll build a show for you. But up until that point, you're guessing. You're going, okay, he's talking about having uh, sex with his wife, but it's not graphic in any way, shape, or form. He's just talking about conjugal relations with his wife. Yeah, we'll have to see the context. Okay, no problem. But I wanted to know because I didn't know. Context is everything, though. Absolutely. It's all about context. Even CBC years ago when they were super squeaky clean, they said it's, it's about context, and certain acts can get away with it because they're certain acts. Certain acts, we have to beep it, and there's certain ways you can cut to a different camera angle and cut, you know, if someone sings, uh, what the F was he doing? 
And so we can trim that out to what was he doing <laughs> by cutting a camera angle? Yeah. And the cadence and the inflection is proper, and you can adjust that. Now it's artistic integrity. Do you want to, okay, we can either cut you from the show <laughs> or cut that bit. But you're a funny act. You just forgot that those are the parameters. You don't have to like it. I don't know. Post it up on YouTube. Yeah. Do whatever you want with it. To do the right unedited now, version. Yeah. We are paying you for this show, for this. So it's, yeah, I'm the, I'm the bad guy that edited that out of your show. Yeah, I know. Because it's the client doesn't want it. We go through, if you want to sit through the post-production process, there's four levels of approval. Content cut, picture cut, picture lock, and audio mix. And it's really tedious. And we get notes and notes and notes and notes. So what you performed eight minutes, your, your performance is four minutes and 30 seconds because you ended your whole bit on a, a, a joke that is inappropriate that we cannot use that ended with an F-bomb in the punchline. So we can't use it. So that's my closer. Not anymore. Uh, not for this. Not event. anymore. That's right. <laughs> You're closing <laughs> with that bagel bit. <laughs> that's right. The bagel <laughs> and the traffic going by. Anyways, I, I, this was very fun. This I is a good time. I have to roll. Yeah, you go back to work because uh, exactly. we is... need these videos produced. We, exactly. <laughs> people are waiting for some laughs. Exactly. Brent, thank you for coming on. Pantel is an absolute pleasure. I, I hope appreciate you make it. Luke taller and uh, more handsome. <laughs> thank you. I need all the help I can get.